Well, I hope all of you whiskey taters are ready because you're about to see the world's most extensive collection of Blanton's. So stick around. viewers at home are as excited as I am because we have the actual author of the book on Blanton's on the show today and he also happens to have in his possession behind us the world's most extensive collection of Blanton's bottles. So if you don't know this is Dom Guglielmi. Am I saying that properly? You certainly are. Um, and he released the book Warehouse H. And you reached out to me not too long ago mm -hmm. and said that you had a book about Blanton's coming out and wanted to know if uh, I wanted a media copy and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And honestly, people, I listen to audiobooks most of the time. <laughs> it's been a long time since I actually turned pages, but I read every single word of your book. It's awesome. I could not put it down. Wow. It, was, it was an absolute page turner. If you love whiskey, you're not gonna wanna miss this. And it's not just about blends. You get a lot of history about Buffalo Trace and how uh, their influence on the industry helped kind of be the burgeoning point for the whiskey renaissance that we're living in nowadays. Mm -hmm. So it was it was very exciting. So thank you so much for coming on the show. And let's kind of talk about like your journey yeah. and how you became like one of the world's foremost experts on the biggest tater bottle ever. That's right. Well, it, and therefore I am the biggest tater ever, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, you know, it's an interesting journey. I I, uh, I I got into bourbon really kind of later than a lot of folks. Of course, it's, you know, it's a journey that everybody's taken at different times. And over the past few years, it's exploded, as we all know. Um, but I was really not into bourbon until probably 2017. Um, before then, I didn't even really know much about bourbon at all. I probably only knew about Maker's Mark and never really sampled uh, many, many brands. And so um, I was a, a boss of mine at the time. She was big into bourbon and uh, she gifted me a bottle of Blanton's. And, you know, I didn't know anything about it. I thought it was pretty cool. You know, the taterness factor, which I didn't even know was a term yet, uh, was very appealing to me. And uh, as soon as I drank that bottle, I wanted more and I couldn't find it. And so that set me off on this journey that led to not only finding more Blantons, but uh, some exceptionally rare bottles as well, which uh, which I'm really excited to, to own and cherish now. Awesome. Well, um, so your book, it released uh, in, in October. October of 23. 23. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I mean, I read it right towards the end of October. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're recording this in February 24. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I haven't done a review of the book or anything is because I knew that I was coming to Ohio where you live, right. and I thought, well, let's just wait and do it in person. Absolutely. And we'll 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 be showing you guys uh, some footage of some of the rarest bottles, and we're going to talk about those. Mm -hmm. And so, as you went through this process, because it sounds like you've got that that OCD collector gene, yeah, very right? much that many of us whiskey lovers have. And so, as you went through this process. What were some of the connections that you made as you were doing research for this book that really stick out in your mind as like a special experience? Yeah, probably the, the biggest one was getting to speak to a gentleman by the name of Chris Falk. Uh, he was the son of a man named Ferdy Falk, who was one of the owners of the Buffalo Trace Distillery, then George T. Stagg or Ancient Age Distillery. Uh, he was one of the uh, the uh, owners back in the 80s, and that's when they launched the brand uh, Blanton's in 1984. So meeting sort of the son of a guy who was part of that that launch and who I write about ex uh, extensively in the book um, was great. Just hearing the history firsthand, understanding you know what times were like back then in the bourbon industry, and it was obviously very much a downtime for the market. Uh, that was just a fascinating connection. But you know beyond him, it's a journey. Uh, you know to to find a collection or source a collection like like mine it takes a, an entire network of people from all over the world and so it was uh, virtually uh, done in a lot of ways but also physically I you know, went to uh, Europe I went to Japan numerous times uh, so there there's been uh, you know kind of two sides to this and, and meeting people along the way has been uh, it, without a doubt instrumental to, to what I've been able to assemble sure well, one of the things that I found interesting is I happen to know one of the other uh, largest Blanton's collectors mm -hmm. uh, who lives not too far from me. And I went to his house a, a couple of years ago 
and got to see some of his rare bottles of Blanton's. But at the time, I didn't really know what I was looking at. And when I was there, he was telling me about uh, one of the hardest bottles to get if you're trying to fill out your collection is a Sterling Silver Blanton's. Mm -hmm. And he had one and I got to see it. And then he was explaining to me, all of us Blanton's collectors, we all know each other. And uh, there's a woman that I help her source bottles. She helps me find bottles. And since I already had a silver, I located the second one and I was able to get it uh, to her. Mm -hmm. And so when I came over here to meet you, <laughs> I found out she's one of your friends as well. Yep. And you know him. Yep. And she lives not too far from you. Not too far from her. Yeah. Small and, world. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the world of Blanton's col uh, yeah. collecting, you you all get to know each other pretty quickly. We do. Quickly. We, we know each other very well. And uh, we've all helped each other in one way or another. And uh, it's been a great community. And there's, there's definitely a... Um, a small group of people that have bottles, such as the one you just referenced with the sterling silver. So uh, I kind of maintain an unofficial registry of those rare bottles. Um, it's not published or anything, it's just from my own knowledge. And that's where, you know, in the book, when I, I reference things such as uh, only 15 known to exist, you know, I have the list, the 15 known, and I'll happily add another name if uh, another one pops another up. Another pops yeah. up. Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those super rare bottles. Yes. Um, uh, one of the, the, I was excited to see the sterling silver again. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, tell the people what the sterling silver is and then tell them what you have that literally no one else can have. <laughs> so, yeah, so sterling silver was a, a, a release that was commissioned by Ferdy Falk, who I mentioned earlier, uh, back in 1991. Uh, and it was essentially a bottle he wanted to, to gift to uh, both friends, uh, industry insiders, executives, and also uh, Japan was obviously a huge market for, for Blanton, still is. And he wanted to also gift it to the top retailers in Japan uh, who were selling Blanton's. So he commissioned a bottle, uh, start, made 100% sterling silver. It was difficult to manufacture uh, based on uh, what I've read and, and people who I've uh, spoken with who were involved at the time. And, uh, and basically, to first, before they even produced the bottle, they produced a few prototypes. Uh, one of those prototypes I own. I was able to acquire it from his son, uh, Chris. And it is a, a beautiful you know, bottle, but it doesn't have any whiskey in it. It's just sort of a bottle. It's got a few missing things you know, on the label and, and, and engravings and so forth. Uh, and then I was able to source one of the uh, actual 115 or so that, are, uh, that were produced. So about 115 of them were made, and I was able to, to acquire one of those. So I have two Sterlings in my collection, and they are definitely the, the talk of the town. Anytime somebody comes to visit me, anytime uh, you know, some, I post one on social media, they get instant recognition. Uh, they are cool, but it's interesting because they're not my favorite bottles, and we'll talk about that when you come okay. as well. Okay, okay. So now that we've got all of you Blanton's taters tuned in with our awesome Blanton's episode, we want to give you the opportunity to learn how you can support Dom and how you can get your hands on this awesome Warehouse H book. So tell them what they need to do. The book is available. Uh, WarehouseH.com is my primary website, or you can go directly to Blanton'sBook.com and purchase it there. All copies sold through my site are autographed. So you can even customize it if you want to give it as a gift. I will customize any message you, you would like. Okay. Right. And is that also where they can find the catalog of Blanton's information? Absolutely. Blanton'sBook.com? Blanton'sBook.com or HouseH.com. All right. We'll check it out. But that's not your, uh, your, your most prized position. No, it, it's not. Um, and and it's, I, I think it's because it, in the, you, know, you mentioned OCD earlier. I'm OCD as well. For me, kind of the exclusivity of some bottles is what makes them my favorite. And so there's 15 of those known, one of them at Buff uh, the Sterling's, one of them at Buffalo Trace um, in their, their whiskey vault. The bottle that I'm, I'm probably most proud of is one that I have called the My Only Blanton's Bottle. And it was a private barrel pick done for wealthy Japanese customers um, back in 2006, 2007. And they, uh, it was also the, the highest proof Blanton's ever bottled uh, was one of those picks. And that was 141.9 proof. And so I currently have the only uh, sealed 141.9 proof version of that. Uh, there was one other that was recently discovered, but it was opened and, and consumed. So uh, so that was kind of nice for me. Um, so right. yeah, there's, I think there's only four others, three or four others that are known with that same label. Uh, all of those are lower proofs. So I've got the highest proof Blanton's ever bottled uh, so, in the collection. So as far as you know, that is a one of one that is known in the yeah. world. Yeah, and, and I, I thought that until about a month ago when another one popped up. Like I said, they opened it, so that's good for me. But um, there probably are some others from that same pick. Uh, likely, they're all in Japan still, and maybe you know many they will be consumed. They may you know, pop up someday. They may pop up someday, but right now it's a pretty, pretty rare one in the 
it's, it, it must taste awesome. I, can, I wish I could open it. <laughs> right. But you have a sample coming from the gentleman I do. who did from it. From the guy that opened it, I will. Uh, this I will community break. is so small that yeah. when somebody finds one of these bottles, yeah. they all talk to each other. Yeah. And the individual who opened the bottle, which if we mentioned his name, you would all know who you it was. You would all know him. Um, <laughs> he, he offered to send Dom a, yep. a sample so that he could taste the bottle that he yeah. now can't open because it's a one of one. Right, exactly. <laughs> I just, you know, so I, I'm excited to try it just because it's got to be fire. I mean, that's, you know, I. I don't know. 141.9 proof. That is just, that is high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I do love a nice hazmat. Yeah. And so just out of curiosity, uh, since most of these bottles are sourced from overseas mm -hmm. um, and hazmat can't be flown, do they just ignore that rule? <laughs> yeah, right. They, that's a great question. You know, but, maybe, or is it because the country of yeah. origin doesn't have that rule? So I think I think that plays a part of it. I don't want to get to the nuances of uh, you know shipping alcohol and the and how right. that might might happen or occur from time to time. But uh, yeah, potentially uh, that's that's it. There, there is a way that you can legally ship uh, these mm. these types of bottles. So don't think that he's uh, breaking a bunch of rules. Um, uh, there's there's a weird thing where you can be your own importer of record and all this stuff, but uh, we won't get into that nuance. So let's talk about some of the other yeah. um, really uh, rare bottles that you have that are special to you in mm -hmm. your collection. Yeah, I think the one that um, certainly people get excited about when they see it posted online, um, you know, auction sites and so forth for sale, is uh, the Frankfurt 200th edition, so 200th anniversary. Uh, Frankfurt, Kentucky, of course, is where Buffalo Trace is located. For their bicentennial, they released a special Blanton's. It was actually the first special release of a Blanton's product, and it has the only. It's the only time they've not used the uh, horse and jockey stopper on top of the bottle. It's mm. a plastic stopper that is shaped uh, with an image of the um, the courthouse in Frankfurt. So it's a really cool bottle. It actually doesn't say Blanton's anywhere on it. And it is uh, uh, 86 proof to commemorate the year, which was 1986, so it was kind of a lower proofed uh, Blanton's. Uh, but yeah, it gets a lot of attention. People love that. Um, and I have uh, several others that come from Japan. Uh, one of them that I, I particularly like is called The Memory of Yujiro. He was a Japanese singer who was called the Elvis of Japan. Okay. And when he passed away, uh, I think it was a few years later, they did a commemorative edition for the Japanese market with his image on the label and hang tag and things like that. So just some oddities like that that I just visually enjoy. Um, and then there's numerous other releases which you know have gone to markets like Poland or France that just have beautiful labels. So it's mm -hmm. you know, probably what I enjoy most about collecting the brand is the, the significance of, or the uniqueness in all those. But, but you don't just collect any old Blantons, right? Like, no. you, you have some collector rules to determine whether or not it's a target for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what are those rules? For me primarily, and, is, and, and this is what has played out also within my book and, and the website uh, that I run, it's all about the distillery produced, distillery affixed labels. So, you know, we, we joke about me being a tater, which I obviously am. Um, you know, one of the things I don't get into is some of the taterness around... Uh, people putting their own stickers on a bottle. Uh, to me, that's aftermarket, you know, like some people dip bottles in their own wax. It doesn't do anything for me. If it floats your boat, that's great. Um, from a collector standpoint, pure collector, I don't value those bottles any more than the original and probably they value them less because of what's what you've done to damage them potentially. <laughs> so, so um, you know, when you, when you look at uh, distillery affixed labels, it's just that. It's the distillery saying, we're gonna print this, we're gonna stick it on the bottle. To me, that makes it unique and therefore it's collectible. And so um, you don't just have the full-size bottles. I mean, you've got uh, pretty much all of the LMDWs mm -hmm. from France. You've mm -hmm. got, uh, I think, all the Polish releases, right? Polish. Um, you've got um, all but one of the... You're missing one. I'm only missing one currently, right? And, and that is the, uh, the, the, bar the bottle I mentioned earlier, my only Blanton's, that um, has a beautiful metallic label. There's a paper-based version of that. It was a, it was a pr um, similar program that they, they did at the time. Uh, but it was very exclusive. I'm missing the paper label. And there's only three of those bottles known. One is in the Buffalo Trace Whiskey Vault. So that's the last one. I know somebody who has one, and I think it'll be mine sooner than later, but uh, that's the only one. Yeah, so once you have that, you will have every Blanton's that follows your collector rule yeah. of distillery fixed labels. Yeah, absolutely. The only place I probably have broken my rule a little bit is I do have, uh, back in the early 90s, they, uh, uh, liquor stores would, would have their own uh, name affixed to the the neck label of the bottle and mm. the distillery would put that on the bottle so technically if i follow my own rules that would be one that you know that would apply there were probably 10 or 15 different liquor stores that were known to have done that um you know i don't have all those but uh, very minor exception to my own rule 
uh, well, we'll say Distillery of Fix main label then. Yeah, there you go. I like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> Distillery of Fix main label. Yeah. That's right. Um, that way you don't have to collect every like side sticker and every neck yeah. label and all of yeah, that. That, exactly. that all makes sense. Uh, but you also have uh, a nice collection of minis. Yeah, minis. Uh, so tell us some of your special minis. Minis are um, an important and essential part of the collection. The um, Several varieties have been done uh, for, for minis, and probably the more rare ones are a green mini, which is the Blanton Special Reserve. Uh, Blanton Special Reserve uh, bottles were introduced um, in 2000, if memory serves, uh, to the Australian market. And, and it was an 80 proof, it still is 80 proof uh, bourbon, and it was uh, first introduced to Australia due to the tax uh, regulations that they have, right. where the proof is, is the, the taxes are based on the proof. And so um, they soon came out with a green mini, but we don't have production dates. Um, none are known to exist, but it was apparently very, very limited in the time frame that they produced the green mini. So that's one of only several known to, to exist with collectors. And also part of your collection, um, which is probably not as extensive, but still interesting, is uh, sometimes Blanton's releases... Um, little trinkets and doodads and watches and lighters yeah. and all of that stuff. And you've collected some of those items yeah. as well. Yeah. What are some of your prized possessions in, in that category? Yeah, vintage merchandise is definitely part of uh, what I enjoy. You know, I think I I um, I don't get in so much to the, the new Blanton's merchandise that you see that's available online and so forth. Uh, but the vintage stuff coming out of Japan, while I hunted the Japanese um, uh, releases and certain bottles that I, I needed from Japan, I stumbled across a lot of this merchandise. So I just inevitably collected that. Um, probably the the biggest one that I'd say uh, I enjoy is the um, the watch that I have. It's yeah, one of only a couple that I think I've seen posted, and uh, I paid a little too much for it. <laughs> uh, we'll say probably about a thousand dollars. You talk about uh, that in the book, though. I do. I yeah. do. I disclose that, and you know, it's not great quality, but I have it, and I love it. <laughs> and it was probably a free gift with purchase. Exactly. Right. Like, but yeah. now because Blades has become so popular, yeah. like, yeah, I'll give you a thousand bucks. Yeah, by the way, that's what makes me more tater than anything. It's right. like it's that watch. You know, like, for the like watch. that, like, I totally get it. People are watching this and they're just like rolling their eyes, like, seriously. Um, yeah. yeah. You should do a, a, what would you do for a Klondike bar yeah. type, yeah. like, stories yeah. of all the right. stuff that you've done right. to try Absolutely. to complete this collection. Yeah, there are so many. That, yeah. 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 Not uh, not safe for television. <laughs> not safe right there. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. What's some of the misinformation out there about Blanton's yeah. that uh, as you've gone through this process, uh, you're like, no, I want to help clear that up. Because yeah. I know that that was part of the impetus for you writing the book. Absolutely. That was part of my passion. You know, it, it was, I think, twofold. It was seeing people post pictures of bottles, some of the rare ones, continuously saying, what is this? And not having a source for that information. Uh, that's why I started the website. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, that became a catalog of sort of all known labels, all known releases. As I looked to publish the book, it, it was exactly what you said. There was misinformation or just, you know, repeating the same stories from the past that had always, you know, been told. And so an example of that would be um, the, Jap the Japanese market was where Blanton's was created for and first distributed to. And so uh, Japan was a huge part of the market for bourbon in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. It still is. But uh, it, it was really what saved bourbon back then mm -hmm. uh, as Americans weren't drinking it. And so, yeah, it was no doubt one of their key markets, but according to Chris Falk, the son of uh, Ferdy, his, his father, they absolutely wanted Blanton's to be a hit in the US. It was released here first. So it didn't get to Japan until 85. It was released here in uh, August of, or September, uh, by the time the bottles hit the stores, uh, of 84. So, mm. you know, it, it's, it's subtle, you know, nuance, right? But clearly Japan was their biggest market, but they wanted it for America. They wanted it to be released here first, and it was. Mm. Well, that's very interesting. Well, I don't want to go over all of the details of your book that's because right. I want the people at home to actually go out and get a copy of it. But we have a tradition here that when we are interviewing, we're mm -hmm. usually drinking whiskey. We are. And people get really upset if, if I don't tell them what we're drinking. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. so tell them what is uh, in our glass. So we are drinking um, the Blanton's release for La Maison du Whiskey, LMDW, as it's often called. Uh, it's a French whiskey importer. And uh, they host a festival in uh, called Whiskey Live every year in Paris, France. And they released their annual Blanton's at that time. We're, really, uh, we're drinking the 100 proof variant from uh, last year's festival. Mm. There was only 114 bottles of this one produced. I think there was four or five different proofs that were uh, bottled overall, but only 114 of these. So it's a, 
It's nice, hundred proof. Yeah, it sips well. Yeah, it sips well. It's uh, it's better than the standard Blantons, mm -hmm. but um, since I'm kind of a proof hound, yeah, uh, it's a little lighter at hundred proof. I agree, but uh, I, I enjoy it. And we also have another tradition on here that we always do a free giveaway. So, uh, would you would you be open to giving some samples? I and... certainly would. We can do several. Okay, um, absolutely. Out of this, out of this same barrel. So, okay, um, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, standard operating procedure. Um, you got to like the video. You have to subscribe to the channel. Um, you should probably ring the bell because there's a free giveaway on every video, and you don't want to miss it, right? And then, most importantly, you've got to go to the vi video description, click the link. Fill in your basic contact information. We run the randomizer, post it publicly, reach out, get your shipping information, get you your samples, sent to you absolutely for free. And you know what? We'll throw in a book too. Let's for, oh. the, for the sample. Yeah. So you're going to get a copy of Warehouse H and you're going to get a sample of one of his rare bottles of plantains. And it's all going to be absolutely for free. Um, and so yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, yeah. I love love the generosity. Excited. Absolutely, help, that's what help, the, help get the word out. That's there. That's what this community is all about. So if you know you don't get to this point uh, with either of our journeys in bourbon without recognizing the the, the gifts those have given, and uh, so I think that's great. Yeah. Well, along those lines, uh, if this is your first time tuning into the channel, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our show philosophy. We are all about bringing people together around bourbon, and that's something that's super important to me because I lost a loved one to suicide in 2014. And that was when my journey into whiskey was starting to grow. And I started to notice the thing that Dom just, you know, referenced. And that is, there's a lot of connection around bourbon in the whiskey enthusiast community. And when I was thinking about my brother's suicide, I was talking with some of his friends and I found out that he had started to lose a lot of those social connections. And I saw whiskey forming social connections at a very rapid clip. And eventually I came to the conclusion that if I could use this podcast to get you connected to whiskey, the whiskey would do the rest of the job and get you connected to others. And so that's why we had the podcast. It's why we started Bourbon Real Talk Community, because um, you have to have a forum to discuss. And there are a lot of forums out there, and some of them are filled with negativity and trolls and yeah. people that show a lot of hate online. And so we created a forum that didn't have that. Uh, but we also learned from those trolls that if those people can hate a stranger online, there's nothing that keeps me from loving you online. And that's why we end every podcast the same way. And that's this. If you woke up this morning and you're unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. of what you have on your e-commerce site, I'm your host, Randy Sullivan. Let's get right to the questions. Do you have Glen toppers? Yes. Do you have t-shirts? Yes. Do you have bottle carrying bags? Yes. Do you have storage? Yes. Do you have an aroma kit? Yes. People, we have everything at bourbonrealtalk.com. This is stupid. Why do we even need a game show?